Gil, ¿te transmite tú el video? Filter. Okay. Uh, dear all, thank you very much and welcome again. Uh, is the session number uh, 16 of our One World Seminar. And thank you for joining us and welcome to the Our World Heritage 2021 debates and the month dedicated to the impact of disaster and pandemics on World Heritage Sites. I am Umberto Bonomo, Director of the Cultural Heritage Center at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And with Fernando Perez, Karen Gole, Yolanda Muñoz, and Hilter Gonzalez, we have planned this uh, seminar called One World Seminar that bring, our, that bring us profound knowledge accumulated from around the world on how pandemics and natural and social disaster have affected and continue affecting our world heritage sites. The speakers uh, of this session will kindly share different case studies, experiences, and lessons, allowing us to obtain a better context related to the recent situation and state of our world heritage. Throughout this month, we have organized more than 20 sessions and conversation, a collective effort of more than 100 people some of which are from the most remote areas of the globe. I would like to, to thank especially to all the coordinators of, uh, of the session and specifically this session uh, and the presenter who will accompany us throughout the month. For those uh, who don't know um, the Our World Heritage Foundation, it seems relevant to me to recall our goals. The purpose of the foundation is to promote heritage protection, conservation, and management, to support knowledge-based decision-making, to promote good governance of the World Heritage Convention, and to engage and empower civil society in heritage protection and management. Having said this, I will introduce the theme of this month, sharing with you a short video that explains how disaster and pandemics have affected the world. Recent disasters and an actual pandemic have exposed the fragility and vulnerability of our world heritage. These exceptional sites and pieces, which we would like to preserve for all humanity and future generations, do not exist in a segregated world. They belong to our social environment and our daily life. But at the same time, the world heritage sites are in danger. They are threatened by natural hazards that attempt against their existence. The pandemic has revealed their fragility and how much the human presence in them is vital and necessary for their survival. How can we protect them and at the same time give them life and new meanings? If we hope for a future for them, we should stop considering them only as beautiful objects or places, merchandise for the tourist industry and fully integrate them into the social and cultural dynamics of daily life. We propose to promote a great discussion around the world on the risks and effects of disasters and pandemics on world heritage sites. We invite non-governmental organizations, academies, representatives of civil society and local governments to participate, to contribute with new proposals for public policies on the conservation and safeguarding of the cultural and natural heritage of humanity. Today's session is uh, information technology uh, for preparedness and mitigation prior or after disaster and pandemics. Uh, the coordinator and moderator of this session is Mario Santana Quintero, 
uh, a full professor at the department Department of Civil Environmental Engineering in Carter University, teaching courses on architectural conservation and sustainability, as well as he is currently an associate faculty at the Carlton Immersive Media Studio Lab. He has an architectural degree, holding a master in, Conver in conservation and conversation uh, of historic buildings and towns from uh, Le Maire uh, International Center for Conservation. He also is a um, guest professor at Raymond Le Maire International Center of Conservation. This past year, he has been teaching also at the Universidad Central de Venezuela, Universidad de Guadalajara, Universidad de Cuenca, and uh, his, academic um, his academic activities, he has served as ECOMOS Secretary General and he is the past president. Uh, he is the past president of the ICOMOS Scientific Committee of Heritage Documentation, and actually uh, secretary of uh, general secretary of ICOMOS. Uh, thank you, Mario. You have the floor. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you for your kind words and the conversation. I'm going to use that now. Uh, I like that. You know much uh, much better than well conservation and conversation i think that those are the two things that we have been doing throughout this uh, this month of work uh, i also would like to thank you and thank uh, fernando and uh, yolanda karen and hilter for all your support and also our translators uh, pedro and luis who are behind the scenes uh, providing us with translation to spanish so people who want to listen to the session in Spanish can switch to that channel. So wh what I'm planning to do is to talk a bit about the information technologies, but in particular, the theme that I had the opportunity to co-convene with Haifa al Durahin. Unfortunately, Haifa cannot be with us for some health reasons and with our coordinator, Christina Camero, and then a very important part of our core team that is actually also members of the panel and that have served as panelists for our uh, transformation informations of uh, information technologies, the theme in January, but also have served as mentors and many in many other capacities in our initiative. So the objectives of our theme were basically uh, to establish a robust network of organizations and professionals and to put forth policy recommendations to the World Heritage Community and many audiences to improve the use of IT in, work, in the World Heritage System. We seek to use the technology to increase the involvement of the community in the monitoring, interpretation, and presentation of these sites. The core aims were to strengthen the monitoring of the World Heritage Sites using information technologies and to enhance multiple narratives in interpretation and presentation of World Heritage Sites using information technologies. And we feel that these two objectives, which we had long discussions throughout webinars and webinars, are also very relevant to the disasters and pandemics theme that Umberto and the team has been organizing. So uh, we, we want to thank you again for this opportunity to share. So these are the debates, I'm not going to go into detail. So we were the first debate, the information technology, and now we are in the, in the theme of May, disasters and pandemics. And then we're going to go into other themes like new, new heritage approaches, et cetera, which also have a very link to the issue of information technologies. So these were our different activities, uh, but we also had a global competition in which we had 36 entries of proposals to either interpret and present sites or monitor sites. And we had selected five uh, winners uh, from teams around the world uh, with proposals in different issues of the use of technology for world heritage. Also, uh, my colleagues, Christina and Lori are going to be talking later about the policy recommendations that we are preparing because we are preparing a draft of our report of what happened to our, our uh, seminar and also the, the toolkits. Uh, this is the group of panelists that we have in this opportunity today. Um, and as I said, we are representative uh, of non-for-profit organizations, academia, uh, industry, and uh, civil society in general. And I feel that we're truly a good representative of the concerns about world heritage and the need to implement better information technologies strategies in world heritage. Uh, 
So as I said, with the first part of our session, so basically our session is going to split in three parts. The first part, we're going to have a panel and I'm going to give the floor to my colleagues uh, and they're going to give in five minutes, they're going to give the five to eight minutes, they're going to give their ideas about questions that I'm going to ask them immediately. And then we will be followed by a presentation of the draft ideas behind the policy recommendations and toolkit by Christina and Lori. Uh, then we are going to open the floor to all of you. So we kindly ask you to either direct your questions in the chat uh, so, so Lori and me can, can ask the uh, panelists. And then I will provide very brief concluding remarks and we hope to be uh, finished by, let's say uh, one, uh, one hour in 50 minutes, we, we plan to be ready because we also know that the screen time is, uh, is really uh, difficult. So the order of the panelists is going to be like this. We're going to start with Dijan, followed by Joe, then Liz, uh, Okubos and Bernadette and then Daniel. So these are the two questions that we have provided to our panelists and then I'm going to immediately give the floor to uh, Bijan. So what opportunities and challenges information technologies can offer for preparedness of pandemics and disasters? Given your current experience, what are the major takeaways, opportunities and challenges that information technologies have offered during the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns. Also the panelists have prepared other questions and I will kindly ask them that I'm going to put these questions in the chat, but also my colleagues, if you can put your questions in the chat so then we can activate the chat session. So I think this is my last slide. And now I will kindly give the floor to my dearest colleague, uh, Bijan Rouhani. Bijan. Thank you, Mario. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, I'm trying to share my screen with you in a second. And then, yeah, if you can see my screen, then I can start. So, yeah, my name is Bijan Rohani, and I work for uh, Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa, or EMINA project at the University of Oxford. I try to answer Mario's questions based on the experience of the EMINA project. Um, the EMINA is funded by Arcadia Fund and is led by the University of Oxford in partnership with the universities of Durham and Leicester in the UK and with many uh, local and national heritage partners in the Middle East and North Africa or MENA region. The project covers about 20 countries in the region and the main objective is documenting and recording endangered heritage sites. Uh, so yeah, I have two questions that Mario raised. Uh, I start with uh, this point that risk preparedness really starts with identifying and analyzing hazards and their potential risks to cultural heritage and archeological sites. Our understanding of disaster risks is data-driven. Uh, digital technology has opened new horizons to heritage professionals for identifying, recording, and analyzing risks and threats. Um, from satellite imagery to mobile applications for rapid impact assessment and digital recording systems, IT or information technology contributes to our understanding of risks and to developing mitigation and preparedness plans. In the EMINA project, we together with our local partners use freely available remote sensing data for rapidly uh, documenting sites that are at risk. We also use mobile technology where possible for on-site monitoring and risk assessment. Um, online databases and remote sensing can offer rapid, cost-effective and sustainable approaches for documentation. There is an ever-growing need to use digital recording systems, creating a spatially referenced databases of heritage assets, allowing rapid assessment of the value of those assets the condition of the preservation, the presence of ongoing threats and risks and their location. Such a comprehensive digital documentation allows heritage professionals to work with their partners 
in different sectors to develop long-term priorities and strategies, as well as to establish the best responses to mitigate the impact of hazards and disasters. In the Imina project, we use Arches 5, an open source platform designed by the Getty Conservation Institute and WMF. And that's the core of our project, the database that we use. But we know that in many countries, there are significant challenges for using digital documentation in the cultural heritage sector. Developing digital heritage inventories has not been really top priority in many parts of the world. Other challenges include IT infrastructure, capacity of the national heritage stakeholders, open access data, funding and legal issues. Iamina has developed a guidance note on digital documentation for the local partners in the Middle East and North Africa to help with identifying and tackling these challenges. This document seeks to establish guidance to develop policies for the development of sustainable digital documentation tools. The guidance note has multiple audiences, including key decision makers in MENA governments, leaders of the MENA national heritage organizations and international funding agencies. It is now available in English and Arabic on the IMINA website. The pandemic has had a negative impact, not only on intangible, but also tangible cultural heritage, affecting the ability to actively monitor and manage many cultural heritage sites. There are also reports of increased looting because of the economic situation worsened by the pandemic. Remote sensing can help us more than ever for monitoring sites when access is not possible. An example of a successful combination of remote sensing and mobile technology for rapid damage assessment during the pandemic was in Beirut. And I think Joe is also going to talk about this example in, in his presentation. Following the August 2020 massive explosion in the city, a group of professionals from the Directorate General of Antiquity of Lebanon or DGA trained in the IAMINA methodology were equipped with the AMAL mobile application developed by the Global Heritage Fund. The team recorded over 200 houses in the impacted neighborhoods of Beirut. The new technology has also facilitated knowledge exchange during the pandemic between various national and international stakeholders. For example, from October 2020 until January 2021, the IMINA project organized 24 online workshops through the CPF or Cultural Protection Fund uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic for heritage professionals from seven countries uh, in the Middle East and North Africa on digital documentation, remote sensing and monitoring. So I stop here and uh, we'll take some questions in, um, in question and answer, but um, in two words, yes, digital technology offers us rapid, cost-effective and sustainable uh, tools for documentation, but we know that digital gap exists between many countries, between developing and uh, developed countries that we need to address it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bijan. Uh, your presentation is certainly very relevant. And I think that you have, you know, answered many of our, our questions with new insights. So now we'd like to move to Joe Calas. And uh, Joe, thank you for joining from Beirut. And the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mario. And thank you, Bijan. Uh, first of all, I will start to introduce myself. I'm an architect specialized in conservation and restoration of cultural heritage. I'm from Beirut, Lebanon, of course. <laughs> uh, I'm a member of Ecomos Lebanon. I'm a member of SIPA Heritage Documentation. And also I'm a member of SIPA Emerging Professionals. After the explosion that hit Beirut, I was uh, assigned to organize and coordinate 3D documentation of the affected area. So I will start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, so first of all, I would like 
to thank Umberto and the whole Disasters and Pandemic team members for their efforts since the beginning of the month and for inviting us here today. And would like also to thank Mario for moderating and organizing this session. So let me answer the first question by relating to my recent experience in Beirut, which combines at the same time one of the biggest disasters of the century with one of the biggest pandemics of the century, unfortunately. So as you all know, on August 4, 2020, uh, a large amount of ammonium nitrate stored at the port of the city of Beirut exploded, causing irreversible damage uh, to large areas of the historic city. So we were in front of an apocalyptic city with unfortunately not enough preparedness for such an event. There was no single reliable updated plan of Beirut with the heritage buildings to organize the assessment. There was no digital documentation of the area. There was no uh, detailed heritage related GIS of the area. Of course, several institutions and universities worked on several GIS platforms in Beirut, uh, but, but there was not uh, a lot of focusing on the heritage fabric of Beirut. And there was never a platform that combines those data together. So this is how the BBHR 2020 volunteer initiative was created by 40 architect experts that committed to volunteer and assist the direct general of antiquities or the DGA, like we call it, technically to assess and survey all the damages on the ground. Of course, not because the DGA doesn't know or does not have the expertise to do that. It's just simply because the DGA isn't physically able to do that alone uh, due to the very limited human resources that they suffer from. So I, uh, I was personally assigned to organize and coordinate the 3D documentation and the implementation uh, of the GIS for the project. And actually, regardless of the disaster, I saw that as an opportunity to finally transfer Beirut to the digital world. So with the help of the DGA, I digitized 40 heritage buildings that were at very high risk uh, of collapse. This 3D documentation mission actually helped to report the current state of the buildings after the explosion. Uh, to provide accurate 3D models to accelerate and facilitate the structural analysis and the implementation of emergency interventions like the sheltering and the propping of the buildings. And most importantly, during the pandemic, it helped by providing an accurate remote access to those buildings by the possibility of visualizing all the damages from distance, by also enabling the access, uh, ac uh, access of all the parts of the building to assess the damages in areas that they were not uh, that were that they were not inaccessible physically to the rubble accumulation caused by the disaster, and by providing graphical models and drawings to facilitate the fast generation of decay mapping, restoration projects, and bills of quantities to prepare files for each building to be presented to the funding agencies to accelerate also the restoration process, without risking, of course, to be present physically on site to do that in the middle of the pandemic. And also I set up with the DGA, the GIS of the mission by creating an easy and clear system to transfer all the data collected on site by architects and engineers on GIS. So now we have an almost clearer vision of how many heritage buildings there are in Beirut, the damages levels of those buildings, the location of the different types of damages that might help uh, and the analysis of the explosion later on, the damages of the pitched roof, the social occupancy of the buildings, the buildings that were propped, sheltered, and even started the restoration and conservation works. Also, we're updating frequently the data by mentioning if we're facing some problems on some plots or if the works on a certain building are complete. Everything that might facilitate the monitoring of the area by the DGA and facilitate and accelerate the following up process. And this will hopefully also facilitate the planning in the future of the area, not just for the current disaster. So this was done in parallel of AIMINA's mission uh, because here we were taking the data collected by the architects uh, done on site. Uh, so unfortunately, I live in the region, the MENA region, I mean, where disasters are frequent. Information technology can help not just during or after the disaster, but also prior to those disasters. Just imagine if we had a detailed 3D model of Beirut before the disaster, or let's say a, digi a digital twin where the real life evolution uh, of the city and its components can be analyzed and monitored digitally. This would have saved us a lot of efforts. 3D models can be used not just for assessment, but also to create simulations of different types of disasters and analyze digitally the physical reaction of the different structures on a defined disaster and will help us organize and direct our interventions and define suitable strategies, action plans, and preparedness plans if a certain disaster will occur based on the accurate simulations that were done. Uh, and to answer your second question, Mario, about the challenges and opportunities from the from pandemic, uh one of the many things that the pandemic taught us whether we like it or not <laughs> is that the world is going digital so i see the pandemic as a positive event in that particular way it was like a real scale simulation of the future so we can study and analyze the gaps 
and the challenges we face digitally so we can work on them once the pandemic is over to prepare ourselves for the digital era. Of course, due to information technology, we had great experiences during the pandemic through the remote access to several World Heritage sites. But what about the challenges to be noted? Like the digital literacy and the fact that not all the individuals, societies and countries are familiar and able to deal with the digital technologies and platforms. And the data management and accessibility, who should manage, select, organize and disseminate the produced data and how to control big data and to know and understand when to stop collecting additional data. And of course, the digital gap and the problem of the unequal access to information technology. In a world that excels in inequalities and discrimination, will we be able to ensure a digital equality? Thank you. And keep talking about Beirut. Thank you, Joe. I, I mean, you know, I'm always very proud of your presentations and how, you know, a situation as critical as, as it is in Beirut, you have a, you know, you have emerged and uh, be very resilient and put your expertise in documentation to work and to safeguard heritage is really commendable. So thank you again. Uh, so let me pass the floor to Elizabeth Lee, Liz. If you... Great, thank you, Mario. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, great, uh, well, thank, thank you for uh, the invitation to present. Um, just as a little bit of background, uh, my name is Elizabeth Lee or Liz. I serve as uh, Vice President for Programs and Development at SciArc. We're a US-based uh, nonprofit organization and have been around since 2003 applying uh, uh, digital technologies uh, for uh, to support education and interpretation, conservation and management, and open access and archiving for cultural heritage. Uh, so we work across these these three um, different fields, and uh, you know we've seen applications certainly on how this data can be used uh, to support in a in a post disaster response. Um, but more and more, we're doing a lot with uh, applying this data to actually support um, interpretation and remote access to these sites, um, which of course proved very vital in this last year with the pandemic. So um, one of the ways that, that we thought about leveraging technology, uh, you know, one of the biggest impacts I think was that people couldn't visit these places anymore. And so we wanted to leverage some of our existing data uh, within our archive where we have you know, these rich 3D data sets of sites um, and connect that to local experts um, with, with knowledge of these places and also some spare capacity. Um, and we developed this online kind of interactive 3D tour format um, to leverage the, these two things. So existing uh, 3D uh, data and local expertise. And uh, one of the implementations for this that, that we're most excited about is the um, implementation that we did in collaboration with our partners at Rapa Nui. So we have had an ongoing uh, project since 2017 uh, to work with alongside the Chilean Monuments um, Commission, as well as Mauhanua, which is the indigenous group that is now uh, managing uh, the sites, the archaeological sites on the, the island. And so we wanted to actually support local tour guides. Uh, travel to Rapa Nui has been closed uh, since the start of the pandemic. And um, you have all these tour guides that have all this expertise and people stuck at home wanting to learn more about these sites. How could we leverage that expertise through um, you know, some of this existing data as well as remote training and things even like, like Zoom, which has really made a huge difference in terms of connecting with different communities. Um, so the result is, and I think I can go full screen here. Uh, the result, which is gonna be launching shortly is a collection of these guided tours that were developed in collaboration with the Association of Tourist Guides for Easter Island. Um, and so you can click on these learn a little bit about the guide themselves. Um, and they've, they've created five different tours in different languages. So this one that I've clicked on is in Spanish. Um, she tells you a little bit about her background and then you actually go to one of the sites that we had previously documented. And um, again, using existing data and doing these kind of training and collaborations over Zoom, um, they, the tour guides identified uh, parts of the monument that they wanted to discuss. The user can pan around. We've brought in other multimedia. Um, 
and uh, you really get a sense of, of what you would get if you were on site there. So it's a it's an enhanced sort of virtual tour where you can go to these different stops, but you also have agency within the experience to look around and get more detail. Um, as I said, there, there are five of these. Um, so there's French, German, one in Rapa Nui, the indigenous language, and then one in English. And um, is, is kind of this amazing way to, to get a sense of place uh, remotely and using, um, yeah, some of the latest technology. They, they filmed all this locally, so they, they had this existing skill set. And this was really just about providing a platform uh, to share their stories. Um, and and they, they, they developed the, guy, you know, the, the tours themselves. So I think this is a, you know, one example for us and how information technology can really be used uh, to kind of further uh, virtual access to these places and, um, you know, appreciate, uh, enhance this appreciation and understanding even in a, at a time when they can't, uh, can't visit. Um, so this, this one will be launching shortly. Uh, I just want to buzz ahead here because one of the other things that was done, uh, which was very important, is that we actually linked to their, their Facebook page. This is how they want to do it. They're going to be embedding these tours on their own site, um, but you can contact them. So at a time when travel resumes, you know, the idea is that people get more awareness of um, this association and the guides uh, to be able to um, you know, hopefully visit and take a tour with them in person. Um, and then just to go another, another level with this, um, we did using the same platform we worked on, this is not a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but a collection of sites in uh, Madaba in Jordan. And in this case, we, we didn't have any existing data. This was really about how we can actually do this end-to-end -end process, um, train people remotely on doing uh, photogrammetric capture to document these sites. Um, so we held a week long workshop, uh, sent equipment into the country and trained a group of students uh, from the American University of Madaba. Uh, they went out, they did the recording, uh, SciArc processed the data, and then we worked with uh, local tour guides and community members to then provide these tours of the site. Uh, so this just launched last week. Uh, you, can, you can experience this through the SciArc website, but you get not only the, the perspective of the students that have done the documentation, uh, you get a tour guide perspective and then you get community members that have lived there. So really being able to showcase thing, this layered history of these places and multiple voices in a way that you actually might struggle to do on site in a real, um, you know, if you were physically there. So I think one of the biggest things that has come out of this for us in terms of the uh, lessons from the pandemic is that there's a huge opportunity to to have a lot of this um, uh, training and technology uh, more distributed um, that it showed us that we can do these entire trainings and empower local groups uh, virtually without ever having us to step foot there and we're actually going to be doing these similar programs uh, in the next year because these have been so successful so um, I think that's one of the big takeaways for us on the pandemic is that uh, this access, it's been a great equalizer, I think, in terms of being able to work with groups that have no prior experience with these technologies and really uh, being able to power, empower them over things like video conferencing. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And, and thank you always for accepting our invitations. And, you know, SciArc has been very supportive of all the activities that we have been organizing with our World Heritage Initiative. And not to mention all the support that we, that Liz and her colleagues provide to many initiatives. And I mean, this new phase of, you know, providing online training, et cetera, I think it, it provides good opportunities to help our colleagues in different areas. So thank you so much for your contribution. So let's go now to Japan. And I want to apologize to Okubo-san because he's connecting somewhere after midnight from Japan. So thank you so much, Okubo-san. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, very good uh, morning from Japan. So uh, thank you for inviting me, so Mario-san and Umberto. So I will try to share the screen. And uh, moment. yeah, uh, today, so I would like to uh, explain about the remote disaster imagination game, uh, uh, which can uh, share the uh, map uh, workshop 
uh, on the internet systems. And today, so uh, we don't have enough time, so I'd like to skip in a short time. Uh, this is uh, uh, maybe outcome, so as a question and answer for Mario-san. Yeah, so what opportunities and the challenges information technologies can offer uh, might be a student participation for developing this disaster risk management plan. Uh, in the case, even in case of the COVID-19 situations. And the current experience is a, a trial of remote workshop with mapping system on internet. I'm sorry, so I'm uh, working for the university as a professor <laughs> of Ritsumeikan University in Japan and also the uh, director general of Institute of uh, Disaster Mitigation for Urban Cultural Heritage. And I'm also a member of ICOP and uh, a board member of e-commerce Japan and uh, e-commerce international. And, uh, uh, you already know about uh, to protect the cultural heritage with a surrounding community is uh, indispensable. So otherwise we cannot save the culture. So for building safe and beautiful region, uh, citizen participation is indispensable. And uh, in a uh, usual case, we held uh, this kind of the uh, disaster imagination game on the real world using the uh, huge scale map. And uh, uh, we can discuss about the possible risk and possible measures. Uh, with uh, local uh, peoples and many types of uh, stakeholder uh, using this uh, map workshop uh, method. But you know, so now, so we cannot do this uh, because of the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemics. And so as that, uh, we uh, try to utilize uh, uh, information technology to share this kind of opportunities with uh, peoples. But this is a flow of the uh, disaster imagination games. So uh, we put a huge scale map in a group and uh, start a, a possible scenario, scenario of uh, disasters. For example, in this case, uh, we uh, start this workshop from the uh, earthquake in the uh, target site and uh, the local uh, peoples can draw the condition of uh, predicted damage uh, on the map. So as a possible load closures or uh, electricity uh, power uh, shortage and, uh, and so on. And that they can discuss about the uh, possible situations and put those information on the map. So as that after this workshop, uh, they can get uh, a very detailed uh, uh, hazard map uh, on the table. And after the earthquake, maybe fire will occur. So as uh, that they can discuss about uh, uh, is the firefighting possible and what we need and what is the uh, problems. And after that, so sheltering uh, similar uh, to the scenario. And uh, we can uh, hold a, a discussion and uh, summarize after the workshop uh, with uh, each uh, groups of teams. Uh, but the uh, participation of uh, most people is difficult. Yeah? So uh, this uh, trial is before the uh, COVID-19 pan pandemics uh, originally. Uh, so for the first purpose of this developing system is to, ha to ha how to uh, gather all of the peoples in the uh, time and the spaces uh, from uh, various types of background. So at uh, that uh, we developed the uh, HTML program <laughs> using the uh, very uh, old uh, OS systems. And we can uh, put uh, many uh, signs and tags uh, and information on the map and uh, discuss uh, through the uh, web systems. And uh, after that, uh, we also try to make a kind of the game uh, to share this kind of the uh, uh, experience, experience uh, with uh, uh, people who cannot uh, participate this uh, workshop on times. So this is a firefighting game. So all, uh, the people can uh, check the lengths uh, and the distance of, of the uh, hose from the fire point and the uh, possible uh, water sources and they can check the possibility of uh, uh, firefighting. And uh, next one is a uh, night evacuation game. So in the case of uh, uh, midnight, uh, if the electricity is failure, so we should evacuate uh, without any right. Uh, so as that uh, uh, we try to make this kind of the game 
to feel the challenges uh, to evacuate uh, in the uh, uh, places uh, within the dark night. And we can check the time and uh, distance uh, for evacuations within this uh, limited scope. It's a kind of the time trial game. And uh, this is our outcomes and challenges. So uh, the, we call this system as a remote big disaster imagination game uh, system could uh, remove the special uh, problems for, for each participant. And uh, we try to develop this kind of the game with enjoyment. But, uh, you know, uh, for individual participants, uh, detailed the two tutorials are needed for the ad hoc participation. And uh, we need a more easy user interface, of course, and uh, system update is needed for uh, compatibility to a recent uh, operating system because it's originally developed in uh, 2005, very old. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is a, a good point and a bad point. Maybe the a remote participation from worldwide is possible and the free discussion on network is possible now and also the ad hoc participation later on uh, can be done uh, through this kind of systems. But uh, uh, we need to uh, think about how to share the detailed site conditions beforehand, and uh, also the how to facilitate and lead uh, control uh, on the uh, internet workshop. Sometimes it is very difficult and how to leave the footprint uh, same to the on time uh, participant by the, uh, the people who uh, uh, join this uh, workshop afterward. And of course, we need to uh, fit this kind of system for Zoom or Skype and such kind of the modern uh, platforms. Okay, so uh, this is a short presentation of my experience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kubo-san. Uh, very interesting, you know, the perspective of the game. I think that this promised to be um, a good I'm looking forward to be able to play your game, <laughs> you know, when there's <laughs> online in another platform. And I put some links there because Okubo-san organizes social risk preparedness course every year. And many, part, many people that work in the field of risk preparedness have graduated from this uh, program. So thank you, Okubo-san. So now let me give the floor to Bernadette de Villa, who is connecting from the UK, but she's originally from Chile. Bernie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. And okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, can you hear me well? I hope you can. Yes. Um, okay. uh, thank you, because <laughs> I can't see the Zoom. So, um, um, just uh, Mario asked us to present ourselves. So very quickly, I'm an architect from Chile. I did my PhD at University College London about the case of Chile. And now I'm working as a research fellow at the Center for Architecture, um, Urbanism and Global Heritage in Nottingham Trent University, leading two research projects in India. I will briefly present my previous work on Chile to answer the first question about opportunities and challenges offered by the information technologies to prepare for disasters. I focus specifically on earthquakes in Chile, a country that have large magnitude seismic events regularly. Despite this, specific approaches for housing inherited areas are created afterwards and are insufficient to avoid large scale damage and disruption. Houses in heritage areas of Chile are a specific, are a sustainable example of their specific climatic conditions using local resources and vernacular building techniques, such as adobe and quincha. Over the years, the pressure for the quick reconstruction has led to a superficial understanding of heritage by offering solutions that look like the previous houses but without considering other important aspects of their historical value, such as building techniques and human occupation. That led me to explore the role of accurate recording technologies, such as three laser scanning or LIDAR in the reconstruction processes after earthquakes, exploring alternatives for heritage areas in my PhD. 
Instead of recording for replication as before, I used the record as a way to question current reconstruction processes, developed an alternative vision, proposed alternative design approaches, and argued for the introduction of the technology institutionally to inform a more inclusive and sustainable method for risk mitigation, reconstruction, and emergency actions. As a methodology, in 2013, I surveyed three heritage areas in Chile, San Lorenzo de Tarapacá, Zúñiga, and Lolol, affected by different earthquakes and in different stages of the reconstruction process, using three laser scanning complemented by photography and interviews. This was an experiment to see how much data could be possible to be captured in a short period of three days resembling a post-earthquake emergency situation. In this time, it was possible to capture each heritage area taken from its streets with some samples of interiors. For example, this is San Lorenzo de Trapacá using 178 scans. The main opportunity offered by the technology is to have a metric basis of the whole heritage village in a short period that enables structural analysis, the creation of, a risk of risk mitigation measures, and the development of reconstruction and repair proposals timely, helping to avoid relocation and out-migration. First, it offered a large amount of accurate data of the as-built as condition of the buildings. Here, for example, architectural drawings of a ruined house using eight scans on site taken in less than an hour. Second, it offered the possibility of documenting damaged houses in a safer way. Third, the data offered the possibility of visualizing the dwellings at risk of collapse and also via physical models as a form of digital conservation. In LOLOL, I have obtained this plan by sectioning the 3D point cloud. Here the same in more detail with houses already repaired and others in progress of reparation. Repairs and reinforcement of houses in heritage areas of Chile were implemented in, in there after the 2010 earthquake, but were not massively repeated due to the difficulty to capture the as-built condition of buildings, which is something that can be tackled with this technology. For example, in Zúñiga, where also almost the whole heritage area was captured in three days, I explored the limits and benefits of this technology by describing and superimposing three laser scanning and hand measured drawing in one dwelling, which is how currently uh, reconstruction, um, reconstruction designs are done with hand measured. And as you can see here, angles and details were better captured by the 3D scanner. The data can also be established as a platform for institutional coordination and community participation, aspects that are currently lacking when concerning intervention in affected heritage settlements. The main challenges are related to access to the technology, knowledge of its use and massification, aspects that I propose to tackle through the collaboration between state and academia with integration of local partners such as NGOs. This is what we're currently doing with a project in India, through which I will respond to what are the major takeaways of these technologies, since this project, surveying heritage buildings in Ahmedabad, India, empowering local actions and skills for heritage conservation, was designed and being carried out during the pandemic. The aim is to embed a lighter knowledge in the new generation of conservation professionals. So, here, NTU gave access to a Faro laser scanner in India and developed a workshop where two houses in Ahmedabad were documented using um, three laser scanning in two days on site. We then post processed the data here in the UK, giving remote training uh, workshops to the students of our local partner, which is the Center for Heritage Conservation, SEPT Research and Development Foundation in India. So on one hand, information technologies allow for this remote way of working. And on the other hand, the recording technologies themselves, when established at the local level, offer the opportunity to provide the required information with precision. These are the 
grade three listed heritage buildings sitting within the World Heritage Site of the World City of Ahmedabad, which is um, what, what is scanned. And the scans were taken in two days that were successfully combined into a three-dimensional model with less than five millimeters of deviation in only a couple of hours. The record offers a range of possibilities of visualization, images, and architectural projections. This is a street elevation and the section of the second house is scanned. The aim is that our local partners can carry on with the data capture by themselves and learn about the processing aspects and use of this data. In this way, we're trying to embed the capability of LIDAR surveying within our local partners in academia and NGOs, leading to its future use even when the project is over. The main challenge ahead is to keep this knowledge spreading not only between the students in an academic context, but to integrate it directly and also through partnerships in government institutions and caretakers of heritage sites. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie, for your very interesting presentation and you know pushing the envelope with laser scanning to provide uh, useful information to understand you know, the risks in, in actually in reconstruction, which is also a very, very important uh, area. So this is bringing us to our last panelist, but not least, uh, Dani, uh, Daniel Paulino, who is connecting from Brazil. So Dani, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mario. Let me share my screen. Oh, I think I cannot. Oh, okay. So can you hear me well? Okay. So my name is Daniel Paulino and I'm a graduate student at Penn State, study with Professor Rebecca Napolitano. And I'm actually um, talking here on her behalf uh, during this presentation. And I'm happy to be here today to introduce you to some of the ways of emerging technology has played a role during uh, COVID-19 and can continue to play a role in the future disasters and pandemics. What are the opportunities and challenges information technology can offer for preparedness of pandemic and disasters? In terms of opportunities, the world of information technology is exploding. There is so much free and open source technology available, including software, built-to-yourself sensors, etc. So free and open source tech like this can help not just large, well-funded sites be prepared for disasters, but also smaller sites with shoestrings budgets. In terms of challenges, though, it is pretty tricky. How do we have, help people who don't have a traditional tech background overcoming barriers to learning and implementation? Learning takes time, and in reality, is the smallest institutions who are not well-funded, they are going to already be strapped for time. So given my experience, a major takeaway the information technologies have offered during the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns would be the importance of remote assessment. We need to be able to remotely assess and maintain the health of our cultural heritage sites and structures. This slide uh, just shows two examples of ways we can do this through camera feeds and remote satellite sensing. But to do this, we need to include more educational resources and opportunities to those in the cultural heritage sector to engage with this. This material should provide people with uh, limited mathema mathematical backgrounds with on-ramps for basic statistics, data science, and open source so they can learn how to best serve their site. Uh, this bring, brings me to my question. How can, we, how can computer programming and machine learning help us to preserve cultural heritage during disasters and pandemics? So there have, already, there have already been a lot of interesting perspective and ideas on this, which have made uh, their way into the literature. Here are two examples 
of how information technology can help us with remote monitoring and assessment either during another pandemic or during a disaster. Advanced in augmented virtual mixed and extended reality have really created new avenues which can improve the accessibility of places uh, for wider groups of people. So continual advances could enable more remote inspections of cultural heritage in the future during disasters and pandemics. Uh, similarly, advances on the Internet of Things and embedded building health monitoring systems have proved to be very useful for remotely assessing the health and safety of a structure. By keeping track uh, of how a building is responding to environmental loads, we can understand how healthy a building is essentially. So this can help us to understand, do we really need to send someone out there to look at the structure? And this is critical in times of pandemics and it's something we saw during uh, the lockdown as well. So how do we decide when you, we need, you need eyes on your side or when you don't? And these ways of using new emerging technology are just the tip of the iceberg. If we can take something from this pandemic experience and is that these new avenues of information technologies are crucial to not only the health and safety of cultural sites and the structures, but also accessibility to the public. Uh, as a graduate student, I'm passionate about education, especially in the intersection of data science and com cultural heritage. So if you're interested in learning more about how you can find an on-ramp for programming data, data science to learn more about emerging technology in remote, remote sensing, I encourage you to use the links I'll be putting in the chat. So thank you so much for your time and I'm really happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for your for your question. And also, please thank uh, Becca on our behalf. I know that she couldn't uh, attend the meeting. Mm -hmm. And yes, we asked Danny and, and Becca to talk about emerging technologies. And I think this is you know, the, the lab is really cutting edge. So, all right. So now let's go to our the second part of our uh, day or our webinar today. So I'm going to give the floor now to Christina Cameron and Laurie Smith. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Get myself set up. I shared my screen. I hope you can see it. I want to thank Umberto and Mario for offering the opportunity to make this presentation today. I also want to thank each of our panelists for talking about the important roles that information technology can play in protecting and documenting World Heritage Sites and mitigation, mitigating risk uh, during disasters and pandemics. So today I'm going to talk with you about the policy recommendations that are coming out of the transformational impacts of information technology, which is one of the 12 theme topics in the Our World Heritage Initiative. My name is Laurie Smith. I am co-chair of the policy team for the information technology theme, along with my co-chair, Christina Cameron, and both of us will be presenting to you today. Um, I'm just going to ask, it says my screen, oh, there we go. There. Sorry, a little glitch with the screen sharing. So as Mario mentioned, the information technology theme held a series of global webinars to encourage discussion and gather input. The, the information technology theme affects all participants in the World Heritage System, and our aim was to hear from a diverse cross-section of people from around the world. So in, uh, in developing our theme, we tried not to prioritize one region over another. We tried to include different ages and people coming from different roles in relation to World Heritage. Um, as well as holding a series of global webinars with participants, we also held a two-month competition to gather proposals from groups 
who were involved in the care of World Heritage Sites and input from industry sponsors as well as to how information technology is and could be used to support monitoring and presentation. And today you've heard from um, several people who were involved in our core team. And it's great to, uh, to hear them presenting their ideas again here. Um, so we're now in the process of preparing a final report with policy recommendations for further action. And we, uh, the plan is that this report will be submitted to the core initiative, Our World Heritage, by midsummer. So today, uh, Christina and I are going to tell you a little bit more about the policy recommendations. And we decided to focus on five aspects of the recommendations that we felt were most relevant to addressing the issues that arise during pandemics and disasters. And uh, I've noted uh, that many of our panelists have raised these today. Uh, the first one is remote access to heritage sites. Uh, the second one is open source data on heritage sites. The third is digital literacy. The fourth is digital divide, the digital divide. And the fifth aspect is just to uh, talk about a future vision for an online platform. And you'll see as we go through this that the underlying common theme is preparedness and access to digital tools and data. There we go. So the first issue, remote access to heritage sites. Uh, as Mario mentioned, we were focusing on two aspects, the monitoring of World Heritage Sites and the presentation or interpretation of World Heritage Sites. And what we found is that many applications already exist that could be used for monitoring at heritage sites. Um, yes, some are under development as Dani mentioned, but many uh, already exist uh, that could be helpful even when that monitoring has to take place remotely. Uh, Bihan mentioned some of those. Um, there were others raised uh, during, I mean, even something simple like Google Street Views were raised during our, uh, our uh, consultations. Um, there are also applications that already exist that could be used for creating virtual tours of heritage sites and providing virtual access to heritage sites. And Liz Lee talked a little bit about this and about leveraging existing data and tools. So both of these uh, types of applications would be helpful in preparation for disasters and pandemics, as well as other situations. But our, one of our key findings was that in many cases, potential users don't have access to the software for a variety of reasons or are not aware that it exists. So our key recommendation in this respect is to establish an online catalog, catalog of existing applications that could be used for monitoring, especially remote app monitoring and applications that would support the presentation and interpretation of World Heritage Sites. In the case of monitoring, uh, this would also address the issue of maintaining monitoring during pandemics and disasters when personnel can't reach the site. And in the case of presentation and interpretation, it would allow storytelling about World Heritage Sites to continue even when the sites themselves can't be accessed, accessed because of disasters and pandemics. So what we're stressing is that at this point, we're not trying to develop new applications, but merely to enhance the knowledge and access to those that already exist and to connect potential users uh, with the resources that could assist them. So in terms of open source data, sorry. Sorry, I've got an itchy finger today. <laughs> In terms of open source data, again, many open source, open source data sources are available already and could be used to support conservation and interpretation of heritage sites. Some of these include the Bioprama Reference Information System, the IUCN World Heritage Analysis, uh, something simple like OpenStreetMap um, that provides access to a data set for GIS systems. Again, as our panelists today have emphasized, the problem is that potential users don't know what's available. So our key recommendation with respect to open source data is again, to develop a catalog of existing resources. And we would propose that this be organized into three groups, um, one for open source data, one for techniques and applications tools, and a third one for capacity building and networking. And Christina will talk about that more in a moment. And again, not to develop new applications, 
or uh, data sources, but simply to uh, um, enhance access to those that already exist. So I'm going to pass it over to Christina now. Okay, thank you, Laurie. And um, I just wanted to thank Umberto and uh, for hosting this One World uh, consultation. Uh, it's been great on disasters and pandemics. And I also wanna thank Mario for coordinating and thank you, Laurie, for doing the first part and thank you to the panelists. And so it is true that the uh, report that Laurie and I are leading the development of really is touching a lot of the issues that have been raised again by the panelists. So it's, it's kind of reassuring that we're, I think we're all in the same ballpark. So one of the issues that we'll, we will try to address in our recommendations is this question of digital literacy. And uh, it certainly came up in both of the Globinars and the webinar, and indeed in the mentoring process for the global competition. So it's a big issue and the panelists today also have raised it about the need really for capacity building so that more of the people who are connected to the World Heritage System can actually make use of and apply the new digital tools. And so we will be recommending on that one and I should just say one of the, the tools that I was among the tools was on capacity building was Bijan's um, guidance document for documenting archaeology and also for the online training seminars. I think these are the kinds of things that people probably are not aware that are there. So our recommendation will be on uh, two grounds. One is the um, Capacity building programs should be available for many different kinds of users, including but not limited to local communities and site managers. But we've been really concerned about engaging the site managers in this process. We heard again and again throughout this, these few months the need for making it available in local languages and also not a one shot training, but actually ongoing support. So not just the parachuting in of the trainers and then they leave and there's no ongoing support for the systems. And the second um, recommendation was really to the World Heritage, our World Heritage Foundation really, the board, that we need to explore what activities we can undertake to sustain this very robust intersectoral network of IT organizations and experts and industry partners and managers and so on that have, and individuals who have been engaged in this discussion, conversation as Umberto calls it, during the 2021 debate. So that's an important, uh, to sustain the information exchange and the peer mentoring would be a really important issue for us. So that's on digital literacy. Then we move on to the digital divide, or as Joe calls it, the digital gap. And again, this is one that, that came up on the Globinars and so on, as well as the panelists today. And that is the access to digital tools is uneven globally. And in some cases it's non-existent. So that's a big issue. And so we heard various iterations of this recommendation about digital tools that they should be accessible that they should be affordable and people have different understandings of what understandings of what affordable could mean, but that they're easy to operate, available in local languages. Again, the language issue is really an important one and adaptable, and this is important too, to small or large scale cultural and natural heritage sites because the world heritage comes in different size, shapes and sizes and it would be really important to know which programs work for which kinds of sites. And of course, the digital tools should follow the FAIR principles, which means it should be findable, accessible, interoperative, and reusable, so that we don't keep uh, in reintroducing the same programs again, and then the data gets lost, and we start over. But we haven't just been focusing on these uh, very basic needs. We've also been doing a bit of crystal ball gazing and have been thinking about the future. And we've heard lots from in the breakout rooms in particular on the Globinars, we heard lots of uh, blue skying about what could be possible in the future. And we will make a recommendation to the Our World Heritage Foundation board about 
considering an investment in a publicly accessible and interactive online platform, not a catalog this time, but an online platform that could serve all the various practitioners in world heritage by providing re reliable and timely information about world heritage sites. This is a biggie and would take certainly some sponsors and a collaboration among different partners. It's a, this is not something we can deliver on the short term, but it, the idea would be to somehow create a global platform to provide uh, real-time tools and analysis for monitoring, conserving and interpreting world heritage sites. We've always stuck with that monitoring, conserving and, and uh, interpreting. That ideally it should be a single platform that could accommodate cultural and natural world heritage sites because of course there's a crossover, there's a mushy middle where some of the natural sites really have a strong cultural dimension and some of the so-called cultural sites have a strong landscape uh, dimension. So it would be perfect to have one single platform for both with different scales. So you can have it at a very micro scale for one building or a macro scale for a historic city or a big, uh, or indeed a big national park, as well as, and again, we know that there has been a shift away from looking only at tangible values to looking at intangible heritage. And so trying to capture all that in uh, one system would be quite wonderful and very useful both for site managers, but also for others interested in world heritage. And we will be bringing forward as a direct uh, recommendation to UNESCO and the World Heritage uh, Committee, we'd be bringing forward some just uh, very, uh, what would I say, particular and specific amendments to the World Heritage Operational Guidelines in order to encourage the use of digital tools because the, the, uh, at this point, there is not much encouragement in the operational guidelines to go beyond some pretty basic GIS mapping. There's not much else in there and there is so much more that could be done. So with that, um, I hope Mary Lou, you're behind your, your picture because this brings us to, uh, here he is, this brings us to the end of our presentation. And of course, Laurie and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Back to you, Mario. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> and thank you, Lori, for this uh, excellent presentation about all the hard work that the policy team and, and other core members have been doing for the last, uh, I would say, six, seven months before the Globinars, during the Globinars, and after the Globinars. It's a never ending uh, uh, job. And we were just having a meeting this morning. And I think that the recommendations are coming to be very useful for the future. So at this stage, what I would like to do is to um, open the, the floor for questions and comments. And um, uh, okay. So I think that we have some questions also in the YouTube. Uh, Hilter is mentioning this. Um, I, I'm not able to see the YouTube, so maybe I don't know if anybody else can help us there. If not, we can also have questions from, from panelists to panelists, right? So if you if you prefer. Yeah, we have we have a lot of time and, and in particular we provided this uh, amount of time so to uh, have a, a more questions. And I also want to welcome, I see that uh, some of my former and current students are also there in the audience and also some, some colleagues uh, from Canada and elsewhere. So, okay, so here we have one question from Heywoon Jun. Uh, so thank you for the informative presentations. I was wondering what potential information technology holds in bringing a special experience, significance, for virtual access, especially when it is comparatively more difficult to experience the monumentality of the heritage sites virtually. What technologies could help record special significance for heritage sites in this context? Would this be a value that might be prioritized in digitizing heritage sites? And I think that I would maybe let uh, uh, Liz to, to answer this question. I don't know, Liz, if you wanna go ahead. 
I, can, can you repeat the last half of that question? I, I so, because I can't see the question. Sorry. I'm, oh I'm yeah, no, I, I'm going to visual. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know because he won't send it to me privately. Okay. But uh, I'm going to copy it here if if he okay, won't. Okay. Thank you. Mind. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we've seen huge increases. I think photogrammetry has been a huge leap forward in recording these sites. And, um, you know, the, the kit that we used for uh, the training in Jordan um, was, I think, just about, it was like $2,000 for uh, camera equipment and recording equipment. Um, and they were able to create very, very good maps, uh, you know, kind of rep. Uh, interpretive uh, models of the site. So not something that could be used for, you know, engineering purposes, but I think you can get a lot of information out of, you know, a good DSLR camera. And um, so I, I think that, you know, we, we've seen that. And then also with drones, uh, being able to provide uh, really good uh, coverage on these sites. And, and those are quite inexpensive or um, and, and there's a lot of capacity in a lot of countries where even if you can't buy the drone, that there are people that operate them and can be hired for the day. So I, I, I think we're, the capture part is becoming easier and easier. There's still a huge uh, challenge in terms of the data processing. And so we've taken, um, we've taken an approach of doing that work at SciArc uh, for ease of, of, you know, kind of these uh, truncated trainings, but we'd like to see that become more and more democratized. One of the biggest uh, software um, companies in this space, um, Reality Capture was just acquired by another, um, uh, the big uh, Epic Games um, and the Unreal Engine. And so that's gonna really lead to further democratization of that technology as well. And the, the cost has already come down quite a bit for use of that software. So, and then somebody else has just mentioned Sketchfab. Uh, great tool that we use as well in terms of um, providing access. So, so there's really a proliferation, I think, around a lot of these technologies, especially being able to record the sites and, and then share them easily. Oh, thank you, Liz. I don't know if anybody else from the, uh, from the panel would like to answer, and then I will give the floor to Umberto, who is raising his hand. I don't know if Joe or Jan or Bernie or Danny, um, or Okubo san If not, yeah, uh, I mean, Joe, just hello. go ahead, Joe. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, yes, of course, there's like Liz was saying, there's several tools, several technologies recently, but it depends on the situation. It depends on, 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 on what you, on, on one on, of, the, of the output you're looking for, then on what tools you have in your hand. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, you can decide accordingly. I mean, let's talk back about Beirut. Like directly after the, the explosion, I didn't have laser scanner available to, to, to do laser scanning. So we, we operate with, uh, I, I used my professor's camera because also I didn't have my camera back then. <laughs> and then we used the drone of the DGA and the, also the drone operator from the DGA staff. And then we did a decent work with what we have. But again, of course it depends uh, if you have more access to, to tools, it, uh, uh, you, you can, of course, uh, get more, uh, you can uh, dig more and, and produce more accurate uh, pro uh, outputs. But it, this doesn't mean that using photogrammetry, you're not able to get, you know, accurate uh, also uh, outputs, depending on the method you're working on, how you took the, how you make the data capture, how you optimize your cameras during the processing and, and all that. Thanks. No, thank you, Joe. That's, uh, that's actually very, very important. And I thank both Liz and you for the comments. I think that, you know, you have to do the best job you can, right? And, and in particular, in the situation of Beirut, I can imagine the limitations. Although I always say that, you know, I can bring my scanner if you will invite me, but of course, uh, COVID happened, right? Anyway, uh, Umberto, you wanted to ask a question and then I will read the questions on the chat. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mario. Uh, I have a comment. No, it's not a question. I would like to speak in uh, Spanish. If you can choose the, the you know the interpretation channel, please. Um, creo que el, uh, quiero agradecer eh, especialmente este panel que me parece que que pone el punto en una cuestión fundamental para el 
eh, para el, el, el problema y la cuestión del patrimonio, que es la importancia de la información. Eh, si, miramos la, si miramos la pirámide de Bloom, eh, los, los datos y la información están en la base de la pirámide. Son, digamos, el, el levantamiento y la producción de datos eh, son, la, eh, digamos, son eh, en proporción lo más grande, pero también lo menos, lo menos relevante, según esa pirámide del conocimiento. Después de los datos viene, por supuesto, la información, el, la, la producción de conocimiento y el, la creación o la sabiduría, todo lo que se puede transformar en una regla, en una norma, en un, eh, 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 en un proyecto en definitiva. Y creo que eh, lo que ustedes mostraron hoy día en, en este panel revierte esa condición eh, y en cada una de las presentaciones hemos visto cómo la información es fundamental para generar, eh, eh, generar de inmediato nuevo conocimiento, de inmediato nuevas herramientas y de inmediato proponer eh, estructuras y propuestas para la conservación, para el manejo del patrimonio, para el, la, el aprovechamiento del patrimonio. Entonces creo que eh, esta, esa, esa dimensión eh, y el, la importancia de, la, de, de los datos y la información en el, la, en, en el patrimonio es realmente un aspecto eh, fundamental que, que aquí yo creo que queda muy, eh, muy, muy bien explicado. Además, creo que es eh, la contribución de esa información a la, a la eh, generación de nuevas estrategias de vinculación entre las, eh, las personas y el patrimonio, que está muy bien explicado en la presentación de, de Okubo San, con los, el juego eh, y también lo que mencionaba eh, Elizabeth ahora, la importancia del juego como una estrategia de vinculación eh, en, en eh, contextos complejos, cargados de, de, de historia, de significado, de capas, es, eh, es realmente... Nada, es creo que una de las estrategias fundamentales para, para la conservación del patrimonio y sobre todo en condiciones muy críticas eh, como en presencia de, de desastre y pandemia. Así que nada, era el comentario ese y muchas gracias por el, eh, por el panel y las contribuciones. No, muchísimas gracias Humberto por tus comentarios y, y, tu, y la manera en que, que has indicado el la relación entre la información y la toma de decisiones. Y creo que ese es uno de los puntos críticos en el patrimonio mundial, eh, es cómo hacer que esa información sea de importancia para tomar decisiones en cuanto al patrimonio mundial y poder monitorear o conservar los sitios de una mejor manera, en particular cuando estamos en presencia de desastres y pandemias o conflictos, porque... Lo que hemos vivido hace varias semanas en el caso de, de Israel y Palestina, por ejemplo, y la afectación de Jerusalén, es un ejemplo claro del de manejo de la información para, uh, en sitios de patrimonio mundial. ¿no? Y bueno, eh, voy a seguir, voy a cambiar al inglés ahora para seguir con, las, con la segunda pregunta. So, uh, Laura. Nicoli is asking or is commenting the problem of future reliability and or ensuring on the interoperability I think is always useful and necessary to talk about these topics when we are talking especially in 3D technologies because we are also have a lot of data connected different formats in cultural heritage so I think that that's that's one issue that we also talked a lot in our initiative is that interoperability and um, I don't know if any of our colleagues would like to to comment on this uh, reflection maybe Bijan if I can if I can ask you I don't know Yes, thank you, Maria. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely it's an, it's an important issue to, to be addressed. I mean, um, in many countries or in many organizations, um, you have data sets that um, either are old or uh, have followed different standards <clears throat> or data formats and uh, working with them is, is, is really not difficult, is really difficult, especially when you are during, uh, during disaster time. So, The key is that, I mean, the, the, we, we are working on this in a way that if we can have linked open data, I think that that should be the, 
the key if we can bring in all different data sets, even they have different formats or standards, as, as, lo as long as we can link them together, uh, part of the problem can be addressed. But in many cases, really going back in time and changing the format or data structure to, uh, to something that can be usable in your modern or uh, contemporary uh, format is is not possible. So that is a that is a big question. Um, what we can plan for the future is developing more interoperability systems that can work together, that can link uh, open source data. But this is something that we can we should recommend for any panel or I mean World Heritage Committee investing in more open source linkable um, data sets and digital tools. Thank you, Bijan. I, I completely agree with you. I think that also the issue of inter interoperability is very important and also, you know, would information technology, would, um, would the, informa the digital information generated with these technologies surpass our lifetime, right? That's a big question because we're investing increasing amount of money to collect information, to process information, to make decisions. How would this data be, you know, in the future? And, and I think that that's one of the major questions, but I think that if we, if we go on with that part, I think we will need um, another four hours of webinar at least. Uh, but thank you so much, Bijan. So I would like to pass to Michelle's uh, question. She's asking any of the panelists, would you consider any part of your approaches as an integration of old tech or low tech with new or an adaptation of old tech? I realize all and low tech can be defined differently depending on regions or culture. So I, I was thinking that maybe Bernie can take this, this question. If you don't mind, Bernie. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, actually, you read my mind because I, I I was thinking on, on replying to that one. Um, I think that that's kind of the, the, the key challenge. Um, what I've tried to do with, with this is that obviously there is a disconnection between a super accurate model and then what is happening in the, in, in the reality. So by trying to representing and visualizing that model in ways that are commonly known, uh, like plans, sections, elevations, at least in, a, in architecture, or, you know, 3D printed models. Um, I have tried to kind of mix both. Uh, and now, for example, in, in this project in India, um, I have to come back uh, to, to develop some participatory approaches with the people there. Hopefully we will do, be able to do it because of COVID. Um, but, but I plan to use that, you know, to convert this super accurate model that, that we have into more reasonable and, and easier, uh, yeah, is, uh, things that are of easier access. Uh, maybe just, you know, printing, uh, printing these maps uh, and these, these plans and, 3D printing models, if if we have if we have the time, but something that will make people, you know, to to actually use that data and visualize their houses in in, in a way that they, they have never seen before, but not only uh, as as a as a nice way of representing, but also to work on that. So you can show people, look, this is this is this is how you use the space. How we can insert a new a new construction here. How we can repair these these areas. How can we design a better way of 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 understanding the way you live, uh, so that it can be conserved for the future and not just come back with something you know design something that it will put there and they will never use. So the idea is to integrate this in, in that. And, and for that, obviously, we have to come back to, to all techniques, you know, like just printed things, you know, paper, leaflets, these kind of things that we're working on now. Um, because, and, and obviously, these, these, these tools, but also having like a, a digital platform. So the website, all, all of it will be uploaded in our website. So people people do, who have the access will be able to see that uh, in the same way. But obviously we will be working with people that might not have access to internet and might not have access to online things. So it's, it's kind of a balance, you know, 
everything will be online, obviously, for everyone that wants to use it and for future research and so on. But, but obviously, at the scale of, 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 of participatory processes, we need to kind of use other things. No, thank you, Bernie. I, I agree that, you know, um, if the technology cannot be used by the people that we are meant to develop this information, then it's irrelevant, right? And, and I think that you have illustrated that point very well. Uh, uh, I think that, well, we have another, we have a comment by Okubos, and I don't know, Okubos, and if you would like to talk about the comment. Oh, you are muted. Thank you, Mario. -san. So I'm sorry, so I'm not a specialist on the digital technologies, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I also think about the risk communication it should be quite important uh, to share the uh, future for. Uh, how to uh, keep the safety and also the keep the uh, cultural value for future uh, through uh, over, uh, overcome the uh, uh, disasters. And uh, so as that uh, maybe so uh, we can share the experience of uh, disaster uh, using the uh, this kind of the remote discussion systems uh, with the uh, uh, people who live in the site and also the uh, people who can uh, serve and support from the outside of the disaster area. So, uh, of course, uh, the actual and the, uh, detailed documentation is uh, quite important. And in the same time, so we should think about how to uh, keep the a possibility of risk communication uh, using the uh, uh, IT and the uh, network systems. So. I'm sorry, so this is not me, me adequate uh, answer for the uh, question, but uh, so I, I believe that. So if possible, so I would like to add the vision for future uh, uh, using the risk communication keyword. So it can be uh, quite important uh, for future uh, solving the uh, disasters, disaster problems. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Kubo san for your comment. Of course, it's relevant and it's important, you know. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still very interested in developing how the game, you know, because maybe virtual ah. reality could be one way of, of uh, developing the game that you are, have been proposing. Anyway, let me let me go to this second question. Uh, the last next question, I'm sorry, is from Satwan. A question to the panelists, how can the information technologies help us in sharing the lessons from recent disasters, for example, earthquakes and cyclones in India right now during the COVID pandemic going around the globe? So I don't know if um, someone wants to answer Sat with his wisdom. Yeah, I guess Joe. I would yeah, go, go first. Ahead, <laughs> so I guess there's two sides. I mean, if, if uh, you have the if, if, if to share you have an emotional lesson and technical lesson let's say on the emotional side you can create you know for the, with the free models you are produ we are producing like you know uh, 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 a video animation with some emotional narratives you know like we used we, we did that in some ways in Beirut to try to get some funds because to <laughs> to, to show the you know the the heritage with the uh, with their importance to Beirut and their aesthetic side, but at the same time to showcase the 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 the, the damages uh, of the heritage sites more more specifically, and also uh, technical side. Of course, you can analyze the models and to uh, analyze the damages in order to understand how each component of the building reacted to the disasters that uh, uh, in case of an explosion or earthquakes also combined to the georeference model on GIS, let's say you can also study its location and how it reacts, not just as component, but uh, in its location comparing to the, let's say explosion site or the earthquake center or so you, you get more information about the building, how it reacts usually, so you can act accordingly later. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I, I think that um, actually that, that, uh, sat, that was one of the comments and one of the discussions that we have been having a lot in our um, theme is how we can capitalize on the information about disasters to be able to, pre to prepare for the future. Um, Maybe Bijan, I, I don't know if you want to mention a little bit about eCorp and how how these you know lessons has been has been getting you know because I know that eCorp has been working on this uh, particular issue, right? 
Um, yes, Maria. I mean, in, in ICORP, I mean, ICORP stands for uh, ECOMUS International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness. Um, we have been developing a database that um, to, to, to collect different um, or, or case studies on disasters and hazards. Of course, it's not it's not online. It has, has not been launched yet. But that's that's the idea. That's the concept. Um, once you have uh, because because we are talking about different disasters, different parts of the world, but really we don't have data. We don't know, for example, how many fires are happening in 2020 uh, in different parts of the world, how many wooden structures or, uh, you know, uh, have been uh, impacted by fire or by, by flood. We don't have that global information that can help us for risk mitigation or risk preparedness. This is where I think information technology can help us to share our experience or case studies from different regions, from different types of heritage, uh, during different types of hazards and disasters. Um, unless we have that kind of information, we can't really analyze what's going on in the sector. We cannot prioritize our actions, but we know that there are several uh, problems. And, and this is just, you know, aspiration of having uh, that kind of digital platform that people share their experiences and, and case studies. Uh, we know that 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 one is not is not really happening easily uh, for many different reasons. And one of them was addressed in, in Christina and uh, I mean, in that policy that you are you're developing. One question is open data or um, open access data, how uh, or how much states or state parties or world heritage stakeholders are happy or are ready to share experience and uh, uh, let's say problems that they have uh, in or with their world heritage sites with, with others how much you are happy to, to share that experience or data online with others. These are some key questions and who is going to, to keep that data uh, online and alive for, for other users? These are some critical questions, but we know that until we develop a digital platform that can be shared with everyone, uh, we are not there. Yes. I completely agree with you, Bijan. The amount of information is uh, over, like overpassing us in, by by a three, four folds, right? And this is a major concern for many people. Uh, I I have been working for an organization, and uh, when we produce a project in which we generated more probably four terabytes of data, those four terabytes of data was the size of the entire server of the organization. So, I mean, how can you do it and, and how to preserve all that data and how can you capitalize on that data? Um, I see that Christina has a comment and a question for everyone. So I, I, I think Christina, but before, before I go to you, Christina, I think that one aspect that struck me about the case of Notre Dame is that, you know, the fire, the destruction, et cetera, but then the, the discussion of the reconstruction, because we had so much information about the, the, um, the let's say, the precondition before the fire entitled the French government to say that they wanted to use one type of wood that is, you know, will <laughs> devastate a forest, right? So what are we talking about? I think that, Christina, you mentioned that in one of your lectures uh, some time ago. So maybe you want to comment about that, and then I give you the floor also to, to ask your question. Sorry, Mario, that was for some reason it wasn't responding. Yes, on the Notre Dame, the fact that the the uh, wood, the timber structure that held up the roof was from old oak. There was a field somewhere in Europe that had been planted thousands of well, hundreds of years ago to provide uh, masts for ships, and it was never harvested. And so, it's quite precious 
to a lot of people, but the government of France decided that this would be the place where they would harvest that oak in order to make those wooden structures. And it's a, for me, it was a philosophical question about one good versus another good or one value versus another value. So that was my, my rumination on that. I think you could argue either point that this was wood that was prepared, was planted in order to be used, but then you could also say that this is undoubtedly of great value in and of its own right. So I, that's that one. The question I put in the chat is about um, asking some of the panelists, if you wanted to create a platform for individuals uh, unfettered, it's, it's a bit uh, began in, in following up on your observations about how much information states parties want to reveal but we know that there is a lot of information at the local level among communities and individuals. And uh, the question is really for our World Heritage Foundation in a sense, because we are an open society, if you want, or a group. And if you wanted to actually create a platform where anybody could just decide, I've been to that place and I saw this and I want to share it, how would you go about that? And it's sort of like citizen science for the bird watchers and things like that. You know how they all feed into big database. And how would you go about it? And what would be some of the constraints around that? I'd be really interested in hearing that. So I think that any of our panelists. What about Liz or Dan? What about Danny? What would you say to Christina's question, Danny? Sorry. I meant to give you the floor before. <laughs> Can you reply, please, Christina? I'm sorry. I was just replying in the chat to Laura, so I missed it. You mean you, you were multitasking? How unusual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just because she asked me about my mail, so I was just yeah, talking yeah, with her. That's I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, it, it's really if you wanted to create um, a place where individuals could simply report on what they have seen at a World Heritage Site, not encumbered by the state party rules or their desire to keep some information not available and so on. If you wanted to create such a platform where people could just report in, a bit like TripAdvisor, I guess, uh, how would you go about that and what would be some of the constraints? Um, the main question will be how to store the, the data because there, are, I think, I mean, like, will be a huge amount of data for that. So, I guess um, maybe first uh, we will have to figure out that. And then I don't think a web application will be hard to do because there's a lot of um, resources online and, and like we can use any available res open source um, data and management systems for that. So I guess um, the, the tricky question would be mainly how to, to store that data. I, I really, I don't know like what consequences uh, because people can come and to a place and maybe I think to us, like, like to me as an engineer, I will be mainly concerned about uh, like rehabilitation process uh, for any sites. So maybe a questionnaire like, uh, the people can can um, can just click, so we can um, instead of they can input any data about any sites, we would have uh, to adjust how how we want them to reply to our questions. So maybe um, I don't know. I, I really I I don't know. How to how to do that? I never worked with that before, but I guess um, that, in my opinion, would be um, those two questions: like how to store the data and how we can make people to 
answer questions that we may have instead of like give an open process to them. Um, I don't know. Thank you, Danny. I, I think Umberto also wanted to answer the question of Christina. Christina, it was if you can split, please, in the in the translation because I want to to speak Spanish. Um, yo creo, um, a ver, yo creo que la, la pregunta de Cristina es eh, muy compleja de responder porque eh, hay que tener claro qué se quiere lograr para poder responderla. Pero yo creo que para sugerir una, una posible respuesta en este momento, yo diría que esa herramienta debiese tener distintas capas y distintos niveles eh, de información y conocimiento para que sea accesible para distintos tipos de público. Eh, el, uh, hay un famoso poema, eh, en el fondo, bueno, el poema de, lo puse ahí en el, en el chat de, de Elliot, ¿no? Eh, The Rock, ¿cuál es el la, la, que ha referido a lo que planteaba antes? Eh, creo que el, uh, este poema... Eh, puede ser interpretado de distintas maneras, pero no, no está diciendo que una cosa es más importante que otra. Está diciendo que las, las, las distintas... Eh, hay capas, hay capas y niveles de importancia eh, que, que importan, digamos, que son útiles para distintos tipos de público. Un público general, un público especializado, los stakeholders, el gobierno locales, gobiernos internacionales, etcétera. Eh, porque manejar la información es un gran desafío, entenderla, manejarla, almacenarla, interpretarla. Y no todos tienen la habilidad y ni siquiera lo necesitan. Entonces, el peligro, el peligro, la pregunta ahí que pone Elliot, es que el peligro es que para eh, preocuparnos de los datos y de la información, perdemos relación con, eh, con la experiencia, con la vida real, ¿no? ¿Cuánta sabiduría hemos perdido en el conocimiento y cuánto conocimiento hemos perdido en la información? Eh, el, el, la desarticulación entre esos eh, procesos intelectuales de experiencias personales, de vinculación concreta, real con los lugares, eh, hace que eh, al final esta información pierda sentido. Entonces, es importante no solamente recolectar la información, construir esa información, no es suficiente ponerla a disposición del público, hay que entregar las herramientas para poder vivirla, entenderla y disfrutarla. Y creo que eh, ese es el desafío mayor, eh, porque la, levantarla y construirla, la información hemos visto que se puede y, y, y sabemos hacerlo. Eh, pero bueno, entregar las herramientas para que todos la puedan entender y digerir es, es el desafío mayor, yo creo. Gracias, Humberto. Uh, thank you very much, Humberto for this comment. I think that is very, very relevant. I don't know, Christina, if you would like to, to or, or be, I see Bijan has taken out his microphone. I don't know. Uh, okay, my mic is on mute. I can, yeah, uh, I completely agree with, with Umberto. Uh, I think the, the problem is, is not a technical problem. The question is, uh, who is target audience of this fantastic citizen, based or citizen science um, platform. We should not forget that we are talking about the World Heritage Convention, which is supervised by the, the, the World Heritage Committee. So the question really for Christina, because we know that she has worked with, with the convention and with the committee for, for, for many years. Um, so how does the committee work uh, if, if I, as a visitor or a tourist or a citizen, if I raise a question or problem about a world heritage property uh, in Asia or in, oh, I mean South Africa, uh, does committee uh, is committee ready to to take action or address that? How the advisory bodies of the committee, i.e., ICOMUS, ICROM, uh, IUCN. Uh, reflect or address on, let's say, this amount of information produced by 
by citizens? I think these are these are uh, most important questions in this context because, as Umberto said, we have knowledge, we have uh, technical capability of creating that platform, but digesting information, feeding it into the committee, and expecting an action from the committee, I think, is the real um, question. Thank you, Vijan. Cristina, you can, um, if I may, I think Ludmila, who is also part of our core team, wants to ask a question, and then I give you the floor, Cristina. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, just a quick question, uh, because Cristina asked about this, uh, this platform, and it came to mind uh, to ask. Uh, Cristina, do you think this platform could work as a kind of uh, participatory tool for site managers to build strong relationships with the community members. So people could uh, point their, their ideas and uh, their feelings about a certain site and their needs. Okay, back to me, Mario. Yes. Okay, thank you, Alan. To yours first, Ludmila. It just that, Yes, uh, but that would be like a more direct relationship between the site manager and the, the people that are making the observations. I was thinking that this was like in a more, is a broader, I was looking more at this broader picture because of tourism and all that, people from all over the world go there and they wouldn't necessarily email to the site manager, but they would raise the bigger issue. But to answer Bijan's question, the way it works is that if someone makes such a, in the old days, it used to be by a letter, but the letter would then go from you, go to, to UNESCO. UNESCO would send it back to the state party for answer. And the let, incoming letter and the outgoing answer would both go to the advisory bodies and it would be reported to the World Heritage Committee in a state of conservation report. And we had various things, for instance, people thought that there was going to be a theater, an IMAX theater put up in the middle of old Quebec City. We sent it back, the answer saying, no, that's not going to happen. And the two things were reported to the committee. So that's, that would be the process as it is. However, um, I have observed cases where, this, where there has been very good citizen science and really compelling evidence and uh, the state party said nothing was wrong and nothing was happening. And that's, that's a bit the issue I was trying to get at in a way. I mean, we actually had photographs of a road being built and the state party said, there's no road and there was a road. So that's, that's where you get, that, that, that's the piece that I think our World Heritage Foundation is going to have to deal with because we're seen as an open organization encouraging dialogue. And so that could be part of that dialogue. That's why I asked the question. I know it's not an easy answer. No, I'm thank you. Thank you, Christina. If, if we were here only to ask easy questions, we won't be in this initiative, right? So I think that that's, that's really important. And uh, I, am, I am mindful of the time. So we have seven minutes to the hour. And I wanted to give some kind of um, closing remarks and then give the floor to Umberto to invite everyone for the continued marathon of activities that Umberto and the team has been organizing, which is really, really wonderful. So I think that throughout this short session, we have, you know, we have had many ideas and we have things that are really important uh, about, you know, how can technology help uh, risk preparedness for disasters and pandemics. We talked about understanding risk, and that was from Bijan, an online system, rapid, cost-effective, sustainable. Uh, Joe explained how he worked in, in, in Beirut, in the, in, actually in the braces of a disaster with technology to be able to record and to rehabilitate sites. Then Liz presented to us a number of case studies in which digital technologies are used for the appreciation and admiration of sites. And I would also like to invite you to actually see the project of Heritage on the Edge, which is SciArc and ICOMOS, in which we are talking about the impacts of climate change also in, in aspects of heritage. And she presented this platform, which was very interesting. And then also the training initiative, because training and capacity building is also a common responsibility of all of us working in heritage. Then <clears throat> Okubo-san, uh, presented 
you know, the disaster imagination game. And he gave some examples about that, how to bring, you know, the understanding of how the dynamics of, uh, of a disaster can be portrayed through, the learnings can be portrayed to a game. I think that was really, really interesting. And I hope that that continues to develop also as a emerging project, maybe also looking forward for the, our World Heritage Foundation. Then Bernie talked about, you know, the work in Chile and how she folded completely the technology of laser scanning to make it more accessible, to make or understand the reconstruction efforts after an earthquake and how we can bring this also for the community to utilize this very sophisticated information, but also very visual and very useful. And then finally, Danny gave us a, a, an idea of these emerging technologies, such as you know, remote access to site, use of satellites and other resources. And, and she also gave us some nice educational tips about data science to be able to, to, to show and to, to develop further. And we close uh, the session with Lori and Christina who presented the draft uh, policy recommendations that we have been developing throughout our, our theme. And I'm hoping that those in particular, one takeaway that I had is, and was mentioned a lot is this digital um, gap or digital literacy issue. And I think that when we look also at the distribution of the COVID vaccines, we can see how divided we are, right? And how the pandemic is going to remain with us, even though some of the countries like the one I live in Canada, we are kind of getting out of the, the COVID pandemic, how other countries are not and how this is creating even more a divide. And this is a divide that we can see also in, you know, in, in, the, in the heritage sector in all areas. So with this, I would like to thank again, you know, the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile, the Centro Patrimonio Cultural. I would like to thank uh, Humberto Bonomo, Fernando Perez, Karen Gold Cordova, and Hilter Gonzalez for all their support in organizing this session. And I would also like to thank Pedro Veloso and Luis Diaz that has been accompanying us with the interpretation to Spanish. I hope that they can go for a drink after translating all of us for so long. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to give the floor to Humberto. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Christina, Lori, uh, Bernadette, uh, Elizabeth, and Pijan, Joe, uh, Okubo San, uh, Mariana, Daniele, and Francisca, and all the, the, the part of the, pre the presenter of this session. It was a really pleasure uh, to hear you and to be part of this. And uh, I think uh, we have discussed this morning in the, in the hour. Um, advisory committee of the foundation, the most important outreach and the most important outcome of this, uh, uh, of this work is the, this new network. Are we uh, connecting together to uh, and concerned about the future of heritage, of our heritage? And it's maybe the most important thing. Thank you very much uh, to be here. And uh, I would like to invite you to the session uh, specifically the tomorrow session uh, dedicated to heritage and social reconstruction. The moderator will be Magdalena Pereira. She was, she's a director of uh, an important foundation here in Chile that works in the, in, with the church in the north of Chile, uh, Fundación Altiplano. And uh, specifically the, the last session um, of uh, next Sunday, we will start at uh, 1 p.m. UTC. Um, the closing session will be moderated by Fernando Perez, and in which uh, will participate Cristina, uh, Mario, Francesco Bandarin, Mike Turner, uh, Maria Eugenia Siguencia, and me. And um, we are finishing the month. We are uh, we are arriving to the end of this uh, one one world seminar. Uh, we decided to put this name because we consider that we are uh, only only one one world, and uh, all are in this in this month we explore this different dimension of uh, the problems of disaster and 
pandemics and now affected uh, world heritage in general. Uh, governmental, uh, you know, tangible, intangible, natural, cultural. Uh, we, I, I don't believe in, uh, in you know, uh, these kind of boxes of heritage. I think that are completely unuseful to understand the dimension of the, of the problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, again and see you in the near future. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mario.